It is such an important thing to come together and share what we do well. We created the Wall of Scholarship to be very clear about our values and the virtues you know, that the uh, clinical and basic science at the medical school represents. There's a human side to the laboratory and clinical research that we do. The people behind it, the people who created it, and the people who benefit from it, need to be recognized. Dave's research is, is focused on immunosurveillance by what are called uh, CDA-positive T-resident memory cells. They live in the tissues and at the portals of entry where they're poised to uh, respond, first rapid responders to a pathogen entry and contain infection before it expands and spreads. He's done some very interesting work on, on vaccine strategies to expand that system that might be good for vaccines against TB and HIV, for example. Uh, and it's some new work on cancer immunotherapy that has both local impact perhaps on brain cancer and ovarian cancer, as well as obviously it would be a great thing to have another T resident memory uh, cancer immunotherapy in the future. So Dave was part of a group of investigators that discovered that these memory T cells were in two different classes. Some of these cells were in our lymphoid organs and some were in our other organs. So that they're now known as resident memory T cells and this has really been a real paradigm shift in our understanding of immunological memory. And I know it's cliche, but he's one of these outside the box people. He thinks about problems that have been around for a long time, been hard to solve, and he thinks about them in a different way. And that's one of his great strengths, but that makes him fun to hang out with. He, he challenges a lot of your you know, assumptions and uh, makes everyone around him think harder about what they're doing. So Dr. Geller is a gynecologic oncologist, meaning she takes care of patients all the way from surgery through chemotherapy. In doing that, she recognizes that she could have better strategies and better technologies, and she uses the lab to improve care for ovarian cancer patients. Working with Dr. Miller, who's interested in natural killer cells, she's really been at the forefront of trying to use immunotherapy or cellular immunotherapy to improve ovarian cancer outcomes. So she's the epitome of the translational researcher, the person who brings their clinical problems to the lab and tries to use the laboratory to solve vexing problems that we can't yet crack in the clinic. What happens in ovarian cancer is that it sets up a microenvironment with ascites that the cancer cells make. It's a collection of fluid in the abdomen that can affect and to the detriment of these natural killer cells, they don't function as well. So she's looking at ways as to how to tune up the natural killer cells so they can work against ovarian cancer and then ultimately improve somebody's prognosis when they're diagnosed with this deadly disease. We want everyone to be free of cancer and, that, and I always tell patients no one's quality or quality of life should be affected by cancer, but we're not good enough yet. So the things that Dr. Geller are doing are really expanding our options, expanding our understanding of how to treat disease, and hopefully, as with all research that works, uh, someday this will be the standard of care for patients. so good, isn't it? <laughs> right? It's so good that people on all the spectrum of the fitness showed up. On one hand, Dr. Hayes, pneumonia, broken ribs, invalid came here. And then <laughs> Dr. Jenkins, minus 40, right? Biking here, his helmet, attire. You see it all. What you're going to... I'm actually tremendously grateful that you are all here. What you're going to see today is, uh, of course, the celebration of a tremendous achievement of two of our colleagues. What is also, however, uh, it is, a, it is a quite a unique thing that we all have seen, but I don't think always remember or hold this in suspension so that we recognize it clearly. It's a thought in action. It's, it's, it's very unique in, I think, society of today where the attention span of a usual person is like that of a gerbil, and everybody's on the <laughs> phone, and uh, you know that 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 that, that sense, you know, of uh, ambiguity and and 
incompleteness, you know, that we have all seen in, in the lab, uh, that's part, you know, of what culminating, you know, in what you're going to see today. And we all have had along this work, clinical or basic, we had these micro goals, these mini marshmallows that we have after, and then, then you get one and get one and get a little dopamine and follow this. And we had a very nice presentation last year, Dr. Vinogrado, Dr. Reddish, uh, on that spectrum. But I think you know, what I see below that is virtues that are unique in the society at large. The first one is just plain ignorance. The, the whole thing about science and how many people have labs here, wet labs, right? You know, we all have seen it in the, in the lab. We have seen it that you're sort of pushing, you don't know, you don't know what's, what's happening. And, and exactly that is why I think science is one of the most reliable measures of, uh, of uh, societal health because it's unreliable. It's always changing. It's always a little different. And that's, that's, that's that recognition, that ability to live with that ambiguity that we actually don't know. The second one is, which is connected to it, is a certain reticence. How many people run clinical trials here? Right? We always know that. You know, we know that, that we, uh, at least I do, you know, with my trials, you know, that we don't know whether this is exactly the right way to do this. We have just accumulated the, the, the full burden of the responsibility around somebody who needs help. And that reticence you know, in, in being you know, there you know, for our patients and for the, for the science is always present in this. And you'll see and hear a little bit about that as well. And the third one is something I would call innocence. Because in this sense only. And, uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, many of us, many of you, would do this even if we are not paid. I, you know, I, I'm very proud of the fact that I brought <laughs> with my team a better compensation to our <laughs> group. And yes, I, 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 I get more complaints than praise for this, which is, which is interesting also. Uh, but uh, that's fine. You know, but, but I think you know, regardless, you know, we would accept you know, that the monetary value of what we bring, you know, to our patients and to medicine at large, you know, is, uh, is just a part of it, you know, and, and then there is this imponderable, you know, that is uh, almost equally valued. And then you look around, you know, at this, uh, at this audience and you see that any one of us, you know, is a node in a network. We work together and the reason why you're going to see uh, Dr. Massipus and Dr. Geller next to each other is that they were a prime example, one of the best examples of binding the fluency across the basic science and the clinical science. And that's how these nodes connect in a network. But the beauty of this, of course, is it's like a ripple in a, in a pond. You know, the, the, you, the, there's a node, there's a signal, and then the, it ripples outwards and touches somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And that's how I think this medical school and academia at large creates a unique permissive environment for exactly what matters to the community that we serve. So enjoy this. The introductions will be done by my our uh, fine vice dean for research, Dr. Shecker. Dr. Shecker. So I'm going to introduce both Dr. Mazepust and Dr. Geller. Uh, David received his PhD from the University of Connecticut uh, and then went to Emory and uh, did his postdoc in Rafi Ahmed's lab. And after that, came up here uh, and joined the Center for Immunology, where he's been uh, since then. And we're just really pleased to have him here. Dr. Geller um, got her uh, uh, undergraduate degree at Boston College, and then she came, or her medical degree at Boston College, and then she came here to do uh, her residency and fellowship, and she's been on faculty here since. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to David to uh, uh, start us off. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shacker, uh, Dr. Toller. Can you hear me okay? Terrific. Well, and thanks you all for coming. So uh, it's really an honor and a privilege uh, for me to be here today, just representing really a very small fraction of the outstanding basic and translational research that is, you know, goes on here at the University of Minnesota Medical School, uh, and really in a, in a culture that fosters that 
thinking about taking discoveries from the bench and into the clinic and to the patients uh, that really need them. And uh, so I, I think I will focus on that, that story a little bit today and how we've been inspired by that, my lab as well as myself. And uh, Melissa certainly has enabled uh, this research direction for us. So I've had a longstanding interest in uh, immune system surveillance or reconnaissance, uh, often applied to infection, but now thinking sort of more deeply about another clinical problem, cancer, and again, fostered by the sort of translational environment here and also uh, one that is multidisciplinary. Um, but I recognize that not all of you are immunologists, so I thought I would attempt to explain how the immune system works in about, I don't know, two and a half minutes, so bear with me. Um, but so the, the cardinal features of the adaptive immune system or the, the principal components are lymphocytes, uh, and those would include B cells, which make antibodies, which patrol extracellular spaces, and then T cells, which patrol intracellular compartments. And I'm gonna focus on CD8 T cells today. They recognize host cells that are harboring an intracellular infection, or cells that have accumulated mutations such as cancer or tumor cells and can target them for elimination. And the cardinal feature of the adaptive immune system is that there is specificity. And that means each lymphocyte is specific for one thing and one thing only. So if you get a flu infection, you need a CD8 T cell that recognizes flu. Uh, but that won't help you if you get Ebola, you will need a separate CD8 T cell to respond to that pathogen. And so, the one problem with this system is that we live in a microbial world that's constantly evolving. And so we literally need to mint a million different lymphocytes with a million different specificities that would be capable of responding to any sort of molecular determinant that we encounter in our life that is associated with a dangerous pathogen. And so the immune system accomplishes that quite remarkably. The issue with that is the relative abundance of a lymphocyte for any particular pathogen is going to be one out of a million. And so along comes, let's say, Ebola or some molecular determinants from Ebola. And basically that one out of a million T cells that recognize it, it's gonna be that cell's lucky day, but it's gonna to have to undergo a tremendous amount of proliferation to become numerically relevant. And that is what's accomplished and it's accomplished very quickly. And so this uh, graph sort of puts the dynamics of a primary response together. So here uh, you are naive to one example would be Listeria, monocytogenes. The relative abundance of cells that would recognize that pathogen are very rare. Now, unfortunately for you, you probably had some hors d'oeuvres, and you now have a primary uh, in, in case of listeriosis. And so very soon in your body, these very rare knife T cells are going to recognize that pathogen, and they're going to undergo a proliferation program. Probably every six hours, there's a cell division, which is an incredible rate for a mammalian cell. And you're going to accumulate a large mass of cells. They probably have going to undergone 20 divisions within a very short period of time. And they're going to differentiate from what we call a naive cell that's been, been cruising around your body, not doing anything for the last couple of years, to a cell that's acquired effector functions that allow it to fight the good fight. And so we hope that, that you will live to fight another day, and you'll be back for next year's lecture. Um, and if you do, uh, most of that expanded population will, will disappear, will die but you will retain an elevated abundance of those cells that did participate in the primary response such that you have more than you started with. And this is the, the embodiment of an immunological memory in its most simplistic form, an increase in the quantity of cells that participated in a specific fight. But as we learn more and more in the field, there are many other layers of complexity here, and I'm just gonna talk about one. And so I mentioned I'm interested in the sort of spatial aspects of an immune system response or, or surveillance. So if you were to pretend that a lymphocyte was the size of a hot air balloon, then relatively speaking, by analogy, your body would be the size of planet Earth in three dimensions. And so you could imagine that if that listeria infection occurred 1,000 miles below China uh, and you're sitting here or floating here, uh, it's going to take an, an astonishing amount of time for you to have that recognition event. And it's going to be too long. It won't be, won't be compatible with survival. So how the immune system and the body plan sort of works with this problem is as follows. So those naive T cells that haven't yet seen their listeria yet are wandering around the body, but they're really only patrolling about 1% of it. So they're not directly trying to survey all 40 trillion cells uh, within your body. And they're wandering through what we call lymph nodes or spleen or lymphoid tissue, and they're doing so by using blood and lymphatics as a highway to get from one compartment to another, to sniff out to see if, if any of those cells are infected. But those infections, of course, often don't start in your lymph node. Uh, I've drawn this infection in your big toe. 
And so the problem with this system is those rare cells essentially have to wait for the infection or some molecules from the infection to come to them. And that's going to occur in the draining lymph node because these lymph nodes are parked on sort of the sewage system of the body, the lymphatic system, which is basically taking the extracellular material from the big toe and it's passing through that lymph node where the immune system can scan it. So if that occurs, uh, you're going to trigger this, this clonal expansion, you're going to trigger differentiation, but then those cells are going to migrate throughout the rest of the body. So they're no longer confined to the lymph nodes and because these cells are tactile. Their job is to survey host cells and ask, are you harboring my intracellular infection? And in this case, uh, it's going to kill that, that host cell, that cell that's part of you, but uh, was worth eliminating uh, because it was harboring an infection. So where my interest really stems from is after the clearance of that infection, you maintain that, that increased clonal abundance of cells that participate in the response, but they're now much more broadly distributed. So not only are they patrolling lymph nodes in blood like their naive counterparts, but they're in the other 99% of the body. So this would include solid organs or barrier sites, or in my, my case, the big toe. Um, but, but they're promiscuously distributed. And such that we can start to think about memory cells, the embodiment of an, of an immunity, as actually being comprised of cells with different properties or cells that are, come in different flavors. And so one flavor would be a cell that is patrolling these sort of frontline barrier sites, let's say the big toe. And these cells are poised transcriptionally or phenotypically for rapid execution of effector function. You know, some people liken it to a gun that is, is already loaded. And if that, 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 that allows them to be at the site in the event of a reinfection for immediate recognition and much more rapid control. If that fails you for some reason, well, and those antigens again reach the draining lymph node. You have different flavors of T cells that are migrating amongst those lymph nodes like their naive counterparts, which are poised to proliferate, differentiate, and then migrate. That will take a little longer than the frontline immunity, and those cells are, are specialized. They have different properties uh, that allow that process to happen. So when we think about these memories that are broadly distributed. And we think about the cells that are in the non lymphoid tissues, uh, as Mark Jenkins uh, said in the beginning, we have to think about something called residence. Um, and I will illustrate this with a, a rather simple experiment. So we have a mouse here on the right. That mouse has been exposed to a viral infection that's been cleared. And that has left behind an expanded population of memory CD8 T cells that you could find in the blood, the lymph nodes, the spleen, the, the lymphoid organs, but as well as the rest of that mouse's body, unlike a mouse that's never experienced that viral infection. So we're doing a bit of a strange experiment here. Uh, it's a parabiotic surgery. So we basically conjoin these two syngeneic mice. And so in these two mice, the blood will equilibrate, and the cells within the blood will equilibrate. And so what this is, is a test of recirculation. So any cell, let's say in the spleen, that patrols the spleen, and were to leave the spleen, uses blood as a conduit to migrate back into the spleen, well, that would equilibrate between the spleens of these two mice. And this is the basic principle of immunology. If we go back to the 1960s and we started to work out the plumbing and how cells move, is this real understanding of recirculation. But when we, when we ask this question, okay, does this vary by compartment, you get a surprising answer. So here we are in spleen. This is the, the expectation over the last half century that the immune parabiont, which used to have twice as many memory T cells, has shared them with its naive counterpart. So those cells were in recirculation. But if you were to look in, for instance, the reproductive mucosa or other, other tissues or organs outside of the immune system, not lymphoid tissues, then those cells are parked, and they haven't been equilibrated between the tissues of these two mice. And so we call these residents. And this is uh, a general feature of non lymphoid tissues, that if you look at the memory T cells there, and you ask how many of them are resident, you get close to 100% in the non lymphoid compartments. And it's really the outliers are the lymph nodes in the spleen. They have plenty of memory T cells. They're not showing up in this graph because those cells are constantly on the move. They're going in and out of the tissue. But that is not how most antigen-experienced or pathogen-experienced cells are, are, are really behaving. And so the model, which really, I think, at this point has been demonstrated by 100 labs, um, is this, that when you have those naive T cells that are patrolling a lymph node, 
it finds it's its lucky day, you get a listeriosis, the cell proliferates, some of those daughter cells migrate out into a non-lymphoid tissue, it makes it its new home. So that cell is going to undergo local adaptations uh, to that microenvironment. It's going to look like a very different cell. It's going to behave like a different cell. And it's going to achieve a different function within the immune system than its counterparts, which you can find in blood and are far more easy to sample. But those cells are not surveying this frontline tissue. Those cells have different jobs. So uh, the, the rationale for all this is really to regionalize uh, immunosurveillance. So if you have big toe infections, you could park more big cells in the big toe in the event of uh, recurrent big toe infections. So we care about surveillance, and we care about the function of these cells. Um, and a lot of this involves microscopy. Uh, and so uh, these are resident memory T cells. They're in the uterus of a living mouse. And in mice, we can do these kinds of experiments. And you can see that they're basically crawling, they're crawling around your body right now, and they're looking for evidence of reinfection in perpetuity. And what we had found within the lab um, is that you know, what happens if you reactivate them? What happens if that cell is in the big toe at the front lines and a year goes by and now you get a recurrent big toe infection? What do these cells really do? And what we found is a whole lot of stuff happens. So in this, this picture, blue tissue turned red. And really what's happening here, and this is work of a, a former MD-PhD student, Jason Schenkel, is that You've, these cells, these, having these T cells there at the front lines, if they see the reinfection event, they trigger all kinds of changes in the immune system. In this case, the induction of a chemokine that is going to draw the rest of the immune system to this location. And as a matter of fact, um, a whole lot happens. So if you stimulate these cells or if there's a reinfection event or if they just see any component of that viral infection, these cells are licensed. These cells have... Remember that a year ago when they saw the same you know, molecule or pathogen, that there was something dangerous that, that needed to be responded to. And so now their finger is on the trigger. And if they see that same thing again, they communicate that recognition event to the neighborhood. So they may try to kill the cell that's harboring that, that infection or that, that piece of the virus, but they also tell everyone else to get ready to go to work. Uh, and they drag in the rest of the immune system. And so we, we sometimes think of these as sensing and alarm functions, and that's what, what the field has started to call them. So these are sentinels. They exist throughout your entire body, and if they see their offending pathogen again, they stimulate a very, uh, uh, an environment that uh, promotes immune responses. So we had a very strange idea, and that is can we use this biology to treat cancer? Um, and again, it was sort of inspired in terms of, in this environment, thinking more translationally. This was really driven by a Pam Rosato, a postdoc in the lab, uh, as well as uh, Noah Gavel, who's picking up some of the threads, as Pam is, is probably going to leave us uh, soon, certainly within the next year, to, to start her own lab. Um, so the questions we had are, you know, we have T cells all over our body. They're patrolling, looking for reinfection. Well, a tumor is part of your body. So would those antiviral T cells actually be patrolling your tumor just like, like your big toe? And if so, could we leverage some of this sort of basic science findings about what these cells do to change the tumor microenvironment? And so how do you do something like that? Um, not so easy for a mouse doctor. So we're, we're good at the science. We, we, uh, we have tools where we can identify a T cell here that's specific for Epstein-Barr virus, which 95% of you in this room uh, have experienced, uh, or cytomegalovirus, which is very common, or flu. But we wanted we, and needed, really, to look at actual human tumors. And that's really where uh, Melissa came uh, sort of to the rescue. Um, so, and so I really want to highlight Melissa. I will also mention that CTSI and Cole Drifka and his whole team has also been incredibly enabling, as have other collaborators, Clark Chen, for instance, in terms of trying to help bridge a basic science concept and bring it to the clinic uh, or, or to the patients and hopefully in the direction where, where it can make a difference. Um, but Melissa was really uh, the, the founder of all this. And uh, so we met together, I think, quite a, quite a few winters to go and uh, started to think about how to address this. And so what I'm just going to show you here, these are endometrial tumors. These are two patients. And what we're doing here, what Pam Rosato had done, was assessed whether antiviral T cells were contained within the tumor. And the answer is yes. So these, these 
these tumors had EBV specific cells. This person was CMV positive and they had CMV specific cells there. So that, you know, at the time was a surprise. You think of every T cell in a tumor, I think the assumption was that they would all be specific for the tumor. It's not true. Many of them are just uh, patrolling for, for previously encountered infections. And this is a nearly ubiquitous finding. So there are a few cold tumors, uh, but almost any tumor that we look in uh, has abundant antiviral T cells. You can recapitulate this in the mouse. If a mouse had a mouse viral infection, and then that mouse develops a tumor, those antiviral T cells are going to be patrolling that tumor, and that's what we're seeing here with those red dots. And so we asked a simple question, what happens if we trick that tumor into thinking that there's a local reinfection? And we don't even need to use a live replicating virus. We just take a little peptide, a little piece of one protein from that virus that the T cells actually are, are physically recognizing, and we put that into the tumor. What would happen? And a whole lot of things happen. So every immunostimulatory gene that you can think of becomes upregulated within the tumor in terms of things that co-stimulate the immune system, that attract the immune system, that present to the immune system um, are, are upregulated. And that drags in other flavors of immune cells. They're invited into the tumor microenvironment where they normally weren't patrolling. And so we see CD8 T cells come in, we see NK cells, these cells upregulate molecules that, that put ammunition in their, in their gun. I don't know why I went into a gun analogy today, but they, <laughs> they, they're poised for, for cytolytic activity, and that, that could be a good thing in the context of a tumor. And these other components of the immune system, dendritic cells, which, which kind of help orientate the immune system and tell it what, what to attack, well, they become poised to elicit responses within the tumor, and they actually will leave that tumor, you will see uh, activated dendritic cells, at least in the draining lymph node of a tumor, uh, where perhaps they can help educate anti-tumor specific responses. And then the tumor itself becomes more available to be recognized by the immune system and upregulates things known as MHC class one or PDL one which is uh, one of these targets for a new class of immunotherapy uh, that's really changed how we think about repurposing the immune system to go after uh, cancer. And so I just want to finish up with a little bit of mouse data first and say that we, we took a, a rather recalcitrant model of, of a tumor in mice, something called a B16 melanoma. And that grows in these mice. If you treat that mouse with a checkpoint inhibitor, which works in some patients but not others, it doesn't work here. So you haven't changed the, the tumor growth kinetics or the survival of the mice. If you simply took a viral peptide, you know, an eight to 10 amino acid sequence, it has to be the right sequence to trick the immune system into thinking there's an antiviral or, or a viral reinfection, you actually grossly change those, those tumor growth kinetics. And now if you come in and you couple it with another therapy, such as a checkpoint blockade, now you're actually getting clearance of a very difficult to clear tumor and at least a substantive fraction of, of mice. Um, and as such, that mouse has now generated a long-lasting tumor-specific immunity. So if you were to come back months later and that mouse was, was to have other tumor cells, identical tumor cells, but there's no therapy ongoing and it's even at a different site, most of those mice will, will uh, uh, not succumb and will actually clear that tumor. And so where we are now, so, so how do we bring this to patients? And I'll just show you one slide here. Um, well, again, this is all this, the human work was really enabled by, by Melissa. We had human tumors. You could slice them, and Pam developed this assay where uh, you basically sprinkle a few peptides uh, from ubiquitous human pathogens onto that, that tumor slice. And what she found was that you induce a variety of gene expression changes, which are the same as what you would see in the mouse where you really had that efficacy signal, where the tumor is cleared. Um, and so, where are we now? So I'm just going to, to highlight really briefly what it is that we've really shown here. So we found that, that tumors are surveyed by your immune system and by antiviral T cells because they're part of your body. And so this is normal. And you could, you could actually leverage that. Um, and you could do so by tricking the tumor into thinking that, or the immune system into thinking that tumor is a site of reinfection. And you, you don't need a live replicating virus. You just need a simple peptide. You don't have to vaccinate the patient. You use the memories that we all, everyone in this room already has. And these are potent memories. They're really probably better than any vaccine that anyone has ever come up with. They're already inside us. And because these pathogens are ubiquitous, you know, your EBV and my EBV is the same. And so I know what 
the antigens are. This is not patient specific. And in fact, I could go to the literature and, and tell you what peptides the immune system most cares about. And so we could, you know, it's, it's not reliant on a very personalized medicine, which, which can be actually quite challenging when you're trying to leverage the immune system. And so it's a simple modality, it's just peptides, but it would synergize with other modalities. And so where we're now is, is really actually trying to advance this to the clinic. And again, this has really been a partnership with the medical school, it's been a partnership with Melissa. She's a clinician, I let her talk about the clinical stuff um, in just a second. And I will highlight, uh, really my, you know, my lab has, has been through all the thick and thin in terms of uh, pursuing basic T cell biology and has taken some leaps and risks along the way. Uh, Pam Rosato took this risk uh, in my lab to go down the, the, into the cancer biology. Again, Noah Gavel, MD, PhD student, is, is now part of, of that major project. And then there was a foundation uh, from Lily Bura, former postdoc, who sadly started his own lab a month ago elsewhere, um, but was really terrific. And then I, I mentioned a former grad student, Jason Schenkel, department, CFI, uh, obviously my department, uh, micro and immunology, and uh, everyone else. And then I should also call out uh, Biovigis, who really has been fundamental uh, to this tumor immunotherapy project as well. Thank you. Well, I, I thank everyone for being here. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, and, and I can't say enough how humbled I am to have been asked to do this presentation today, uh, both by Dean Toller and Dr. Shacker. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the clinical part of this uh, work that we've been doing together with David Matsapost. And so the title of my presentation is Harnessing the Immune System for Cancer from Bench to Bedside and Back Again. When I was a fellow here at the University of Minnesota, I remember spending hours in the operating room during the day and then at night returning to the floor where I would have to round at least 30 patients. And inevitably, the ones with ovarian cancer tended to be the most ill, they had the most questions, and they wanted to know what the outcome of this disease was going to be. Ultimately, after spending so much time, I created a video called Living with Ovarian Cancer. Uh, we use this in a prospective randomized trial to try to teach patients with ovarian cancer what it meant to live with this disease and what options there were for them. And I just wanted to show you this a little bit about the video so that you can see what these patients are facing. I had about five and a half months of a remission and then I um, recurred. And since then, I've actually mostly been getting treatment, but I do have, you know, periods of time here and there where, um, where I'm not, where I haven't been in treatment. It's kind of like you have a, a shadow. You know you have a shadow. And so you're basically trying to beat the shadow to your next place. It takes all, it takes all your might to fight every day. But um, that's me. I can't give it. The recognition that when you recur after having ovarian cancer, that you will not be cured. And that's the bottom line. Even today, that video was made a long time ago. When I first started my uh, career here in 2005, we still cannot cure these patients. And uh, the reason being that we have no good screening test for this disease. So despite ultrasounds, despite CA125 levels, which is a blood test, we cannot screen. Most of the patients who walk into my office have advanced stage disease, so stage three or stage four. They often have very large masses, as is shown in this uh, CT scan. They have ascites, which dominates throughout the peritoneal cavity, and oftentimes have metastatic disease to visceral organs. Uh, this is a picture showing how much tumor there actually is by the time we end up going to the operating room with these patients. You can see it, it involves the transverse colon, it involves peritoneal surfaces, uh, and we spend hours and hours in the operating room trying to debulk these patients or remove as much tumor as we can to get them to what's called an R0 state so that they have no disease left. And that's because we know it really correlates with how long they will survive. I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview here of the progress that's been made in ovarian cancer really since I was born. So this is obviously going to tell you my age, but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. So uh, in the early 1970s, when I was born, the overall survival for women with ovarian cancer was less than a year. My mom took me my first Madonna concert here. <laughs> and then cisplatinum came into the, into the picture, and that really gave us some hope, and, and patients started to live for uh, up to two years at that point. 
Uh, during that time, as I went to Boston College and then went on to medical school, paclitaxel came into the picture. And this is when someone figured out you could get chemotherapy from a yew tree. And so uh, we were excited with this, and, and that brought our survival up to about 34 months. During my residency uh, here at the University of Minnesota, September 11th happened, and I was over across the river in Riverside in the midst of a surgery and came out and found out the devastating news. Shortly after that time, uh, we started to combine paclitaxel and carboplatinum, and that's really when we got the uh, survival up to about uh, around five years. We got beyond five years when we started with intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So that means delivering chemotherapy directly into the, into the abdomen of women. Now, some of these patients could then live beyond five years, but unfortunately, since that time, not much has changed. If you look at this uh, uh, graph here showing from 1975, the five-year-old relative survival was about 34%. If you look at 2019, of all the women who walk into my office, less than 50% of them will still be living at five years. Although this is grim, these statistics, I think there is some hope in immunotherapy. And as Dr. Moskowitz noted, you know, we're really starting to focus this, our attention on, on the use of immunotherapy in this disease. A landmark paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by some of our colleagues at Penn really put uh, the fact that ovarian cancer may be immunogenic. And you can look at this uh, in terms of the number of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that were seen in patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer. So if you took all comers, stage three and stage four, who are optimally debulked, meaning all the tumors re were removed, those patients that had responses were the ones that had these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And you can look at this Kaplan-Meier curve that shows their overall survival as well as progression for your yeast survival was significantly better. So uh, Dean Toller talked about these nodes. And, and I have to tell you, this is a bibliometric analysis of basically my work that's been done since uh, I came to the University of Minnesota and looking at earlier stages of my career where, where our, the nodes are in purple and then the yellow or the uh, orange color are the more recent ones. And what I've really been focusing on is the natural killer cell uh, and the use of immunotherapy in this disease. So in, in walking through time from 2010 to 2015, I ended up uh, inheriting a laboratory, uh, much to my surprise. Uh, one of my colleagues who I was working with had left for another institution to take a big position. And I had an American Cancer Society grant at that time, so I ended up having to establish my own laboratory. Uh, during that time, I was still busy surgically, and I had two uh, beautiful baby girls, and uh, so it was a, a busy time in my life. I want to talk to you a little bit about how natural killer cells work. And again, this is going to be the very quick overview. But there are three main mechanisms of action. One is direct cytotoxicity. So that's basically degranulation, where granzymes and perforins are released to kill a virally infected or tumor cell. The second type is something I'm going to talk more about in this talk, this ADCC, or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. This is where death occurs via death receptors on the NK cells. And then all, the third way is through cytokine production. So basically, this is where the NK cells get activated, and then they release tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma to recruit, recruit other members of the immune system towards the tumor. My first clinical trial using natural killer cell therapy uh, took after Dr. Miller's trial that was published in 2005. I basically talked him into doing solid tumor immunotherapy. He had been doing it in AML or in acute myeloid leukemia. And so what we ended up doing is taking NK cells from a healthy donor. So, oops, sorry. Healthy donor, which is uh, here, and giving them back to patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer. So the healthy donors and case cells were removed. They were T cell and B cell depleted and then given IL-2 ex vivo to stimulate them. They were then given back IV. And this was done after a high dose cytoxin fludarabine chemotherapy to essentially make space for these new natural killer cells to come in. We then chased it with interleukin-2 to try to stimulate those NK cells. 
So we were somewhat disappointed in this trial in the fact that of the 20 women that we treated, uh, 15 of them had NK cells, but they only lasted up to seven days. Uh, whereas in Dr. Miller's original trial, where he was doing this in AML, he saw significant responses in remission in patients who had NK cells that persisted out beyond 14 days. We think the reason for this failure or the lack of expansion beyond seven days was because of these cells called T-regulatory cells. Now, T-regulatory cells are cells that suppress NK cells as well as T cells, so they suppress the immune system. And what happened here is if you see pre-chemotherapy, the, the percent of T-regulatory cells was less than 10%, so it was low. But by the time we reached day 14, that had significantly increased. So what we were thinking is that this was causing immune suppression of the NK cells and would not allow them to, to expand. So thus, we learned something from this trial uh, and that we, we were not able to give these cells IV uh, because of host rejection, because of the suppression by T regulatory cells, and because of competition. So at this point, I went back to the laboratory with my group, and we said, how can we really improve uh, NK cell killing? Our colleagues uh, in the Netherlands at that point showed us some data that was really interesting to us, and that was the fact that they looked in, within the peritoneal cavity of women with ovarian cancer, and they found that the women who lived the longest had high levels of natural killer cells versus those that had low levels who died much earlier. Uh, what was more interesting to us is that T cells didn't really seem to make a difference. It was all really from the natural killer cells. So in our um, mouse model, so this is a xenogeneic mouse model. So basically what we did is we went in and we delivered NK cells uh, directly into the peritoneal cavity of mice that, that we had put human ovarian cancer into. So if you look at this, this is our negative control, so nothing in the abdomen of mice. This is, has tumor in it, and this is the treated mouse model. So where we had given the donor peripheral blood NK cells, so the same product that we had given in our patients, we delivered it directly. And we were really excited about this and the fact that uh, you can see by day 14, we had significant decrease in the tumor burden as shown in, this, in these mice there. So at this point, we said, okay, let's go back to the bedside and let's answer the question, can we really deliver natural killer cells directly into the patient's abdomen and see similar responses that we're seeing in the mice? So here, uh, again, showing a little bit of what I concentrated on from 2016 to 2019. Uh, again, natural killer is the center. But we really started to focus on the immunosuppressive environment within the peritoneal cavity of women with ovarian cancer. Uh, we know it's a very immunoresistant uh, uh, place. Also, <laughs> we added one more child to the mix. So. <laughs> again, probably crazy. But anyway, so... <laughs> Um, what we knew here is that our prior, prior trial in IV therapy did not work in delivering NK cells. We knew blood persistence was not there as it had been in the patients who had AML. Uh, we had saw so no obvious clinical sign with this delivery, and we really hypothesized that perhaps we could deliver the NK cells within the peritoneal cavity, and this may overcome that whole rejection. Maybe we won't have as many problems with the T regulatory cells, and perhaps that this was an immune privileged site. We did, however, know that we needed a better NK cell product. So again, I'm going to give uh, accolades to Frank Saihaki and again to Jeff Miller, who uh, really studied the fact that human CMV, when a, a person is infected with this, brings about a different kind of NK cell. One that's called an adopt adaptive NK cell is shown here. And the differences with this type of cell is there, there's some epigenetic regulation, it's called, where there's upregulation of certain receptors on the uh, NK cells, such as NKG2C, which is a stimulatory receptor, and then there's decreases of, of uh, inhibitory receptors like PD1, which are checkpoint inhibitor or checkpoint molecules. Uh, so what we found with this new type of cell is that it's a, it kills better. There's stronger antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, so stronger killing and uh, 
the most important thing I think about this is that it's inherently resistant to those T regulatory cells that gave us a problem with the IV uh, trial. So this is our ongoing clinical trial right now. It's called the Apollo study. We're doing this with a, a Fate Therapeutics as one of our partners. And this is a phase one clinical trial where we're putting interperineal catheters into patients with recurrent ovarian cancer. We're, we're giving them a, a lower dose, actually, of cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, so it can be done as an outpatient. And then patients are receiving this adaptive NK cell product that's actually made in our GMP facility here uh, in the St. Paul campus. Patients then go on to receive the IL-2 uh, to hopefully stimulate the NK cells. And then we evaluate them at day 28 for both response and toxicity. So we are encouraged by some of the findings to date. Uh, so of some of the patients that we have been treated, we've seen persistence of NK cells beyond that seven days, so now up to 14 days, uh, as shown here. And I think what's more exciting is we have seen tumor response. And so this is an example of a CT scan uh, of a woman who had a, about a five-centimeter left pelvic sidewall mass that had shrunk down by half uh, by day 28. And so this patient was getting retreated we, with the option of retreatment within the peritoneal cavity, and uh, we're waiting for those results now. So we then started asking, well, these and giving NK cells from donors uh, is cumbersome. So is there any other way to stimulate NK cells within the peritoneal cavity without having to give them ex uh, exogenously? So there's a, a drug called IL-15 superagonist, or, or we call it ALT-803, uh, as shown here. It has an FC receptor that allows the IL-15 to stick around for a lot longer, so a half-life of about five days. And we have an ongoing clinical trial now looking at the use of this drug because we think it can expand natural killer cells within the peritoneal cavity. What this is showing here is it's called a CYTOF assay. And so we are excited with the fact that with this drug, we can increase the number of NK cells within the peritoneal cavity. And that's showing up here. So you can see over time, uh, more NK cells are present. But what we also found is this PD-1. And Dr. Bassip has talked a little bit about this. We, we found this by accident, really, that the fact when we give this drug, PD-1 is upregulated. Now, PD-1 is a receptor on the NK cells that basically puts the brakes on immune killing. So we don't want that to happen because uh, when this binds to PD-L1, there's no killing. So we were not happy with this. What we ended up doing then is going back to our mass model and saying, okay, how can we try to, to fix this problem? And again, as David mentioned before, there are uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Keytruda, these checkpoint inhibitors that are on the, on the uh, commercials that treat melanoma, they can treat lung cancer. So what we did is we added a checkpoint inhibitor to the ALT-803 or this IL-15 and the NK cells. And this significantly inhibited uh, uh, tumor growth in our mouse model. So this cartoon, as it's shown here, this is the antibody. It, it basically blocks that PD-1, takes off the break, and the uh, uh, killing occurs. And I think this is shown fairly nicely here in this real-time spheroid assay. So the green are ovarian cancer spheroids. The red are the natural killer cells. And if you look at this here, this is the um, one that has both NK cells, IL-15, and checkpoint inhibitors. And over time, you'll see that these NK cells are basically are, uh, called into the site of the spheroid of the green ovarian cancer that's in the middle and basically engulfs it. So we are currently uh, uh, planning a clinical trial to use this triple combination in patients with uh, recurrent disease. So future trials. Can we find a better cell to product? And that's really what we're looking for. So we know right now with the, the NK cells that we give, uh, it's cumbersome, it's time consuming, it's costly, and uh, we're trying to find a better product. And, and this is really what we're, we're looking at now. So again, in combination with Fate Therapeutics, we now have available to us something called an induced pluripotent stem cell that arises from fibroblasts, and it's shown here. 
This undergoes multi-gene editing uh, to basically give a master cell line uh, that's re uh, renewable. It's engineered and can be de-differentiated into CD34 progenitor uh, pro cells. And when we get here, these can be differentiated into what we call INK cells. So it's basically unlimited scalability. We c it's consistent. It's uniform. So instead of having to have multiple donors, we can just give this back uh, off the shelf. And the important thing about this that I want to show you, and the, and the reason we're excited about this, uh, is the fact that on NK cells, there's a receptor called CD16A that binds with uh, uh, the FC region of this antibody, which binds to an antigen on a tumor cell. Now, these antibodies that we've given in ovarian cancer, like Herceptin and Herbitex, have not worked to date. Uh, now, what we know, the reason that they're not working is because there's clipping of this receptor called CD16A. And so this antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity can't work because of the clipping. And we've seen this in our ascites samples. So uh, you can see here the, CD, the percent of NK cells with CD16 are really low. So they don't have these receptors. Whereas in the peripheral blood, those receptors are there. And in normal patients or in normal people, the receptor is there. So we know the microenvironment within the ovarian cancer is causing this clipping. I have to thank uh, Bruce Walchek because this is really his work. And, and it's really, uh, I think, going to change how we deliver this therapy. So. Uh, Bruce Walschek, who's in the Department of, of Veterinary Medicine, has come up with a, a cleavage-resistant CD16A. So basically, uh, this is what, it's a high affinity molecule that cannot be cleaved, so that receptor cannot be cleaved. And what we're doing is we're basically putting it on the INK, so those off-the-shelf natural killer cells. So one of our, our potential trials, hopefully, that we will do after, uh, in the beginning of the next year will be to use these uh, engineered uh, high-affinity CD16-alpha receptors on the INK cells in combination with a drug called Herceptin, uh, which is an antigen on the ovarian cancer to promote better killing. So last but not least, this is our trial that we have planned with Dr. Masipist. Uh, it will be a phase one clinical trial where basically we're going to give two doses of his peptide alarm therapy. We'll do biopsies prior to and afterwards in combination with those check band inhibitors that he spoke about. And our goal is really to assess uh, immune activation of these tumors and reduction or elimination of the tumor. So we're very excited about this trial. So uh, to end, uh, and again, going back to the nodes, I, I have to say this is where I started in, in 2005. And uh, since that time, and I think this speaks to team science, uh, you can see the collaborations that we've made uh, with people uh, around the country. And I think um, it speaks to the fact that the University of Minnesota is kind of that central node. And as they, they go out both nationwide and uh, across continents, it, it's critical to remember how much and how important these interactions are between scientists and clinicians to really bring these therapies to uh, people with cancer. So I have to thank these people. I couldn't, this is all their work and a, a huge effort on everyone's part, and uh, especially to Jeff Miller, who has been my steadfast mentor uh, for, for a long time now, and uh, Martin Felices, who is uh, in the laboratory and really is an uh, amazing mind. I have to thank Laura Benzik, who's the mouse guru and has done all the work that you, a lot of the work that's been seen here, as well as Rachel Hops, Aaron Wesley, uh, members of, of, of Jeff's lab, Bahia Kodal, Peter Hinderley, Frank, Cy Hockey, Bruce Walchek, and David Masipus. Uh, Rachel Isaacson Bogle, again, a biostician, but so much more than that. She's been amazing. And then uh, uh, the other members who are, are here. So I also have to say to thank the clinical trials team uh, the, and the clinical trials office. Uh, it really takes a village to run these clinical trials, and, and we could not have done it without them, as well as my own division and the rest of the people on this trial. So I thank you very much. So I told you, right? This is unbelievable. This is beautiful. If you, this is the thought in action. This is, this is exactly how we come 
the full circle, and I very much liked, you know, including the Madonna concert, <laughs> the, the timeline, you know, because we truly are <laughs> pushing on that envelope, you know, of, of not knowing, you know, and uh, I'm thinking, you know, Max Cooper, you know, David, you know, talked about T lymphocytes, right? That's, you know, here on this campus, he, he identified them, and uh, I cannot, you know, hide, you know, that, you know, I am a little, you know, anxious to wait for next October because he got Laskers this year, and about 50% of people who get Laskers get Nobel. So this is oh, not yeah. Carolina's guy, it's not Stockholm, <laughs> but, but, but if I. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to start somewhere, That's Leo. Right. You know, I, I never give up. All right, so uh, it's my honor to uh, you congratulate so you on this uh, Dean's Distinguished uh, Lectureship, Research mm -hmm. Lectureship. Help me congratulate Dr. Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Masipus, it was beautiful. You know, I, I always like, you know, how you have this focused, intense look on people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very, very good. It's my honor to congratulate you Thank on you. this award. Uh, help me congratulate Dr. Massimus. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we have another unique thing, you know, as a, as a tradition that was started by my predecessor, Dean Jackson, and that is uh, that we award this uh, Wall of Scholarship Awards. So what it is, it's that ripple effect that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, that stone that, 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 that falls in the pond of knowledge and these, these ripples touch many, many, many people. And you have to touch really, really many, like more than a thousand references to be in this distinguished group. So the first one goes to uh, Dr. Robert Foley from the Department of Medicine for the paper published in Kidney International in 1995 term clinical and echocardiographic disease in patients starting end stage renal disease therapy. And uh, Dr. Patrick Nackman will receive it on behalf of Dr. Robert Foley. Dr. Nackman. <laughs> Congratulations. You didn't earn it, but <laughs> don't look. It's beautiful. It, don't look. You cannot keep it, though. <laughs> Just, you know, on, on the loan. You know, no, no, just enjoy it while it lasts. Uh, the next one in this uh, esteemed group is Dr. Kelvin O. Lim uh, from the Department of Psychiatry, my friend. Uh, he's here because I shook his hand. He published a, a paper in Archives of Neurology in 1994. And uh, the title was A Quantitative Magnetic Resonance Imaging Study of Changes in Brain Morphology from Infancy to Late Adulthood. Dr. Lim. There he is. Congratulations. Thank you. Please. Oh, that, that's good. Uh, the third one is uh, Chuck Ryan, Dr. Ryan, uh, who had my, you know, one of my favorite journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, 2013, uh, from Department of Medicine. Uh, he published a paper termed abiraterone in metastatic prostate cancer without previous chemotherapy. Chuck, there he is. <laughs> Dr. Ryan. Yeah. And this goes to uh, Dr. Kim from Department of Biochemistry, Molecular Biologists and Biophysics in Molecular Biology of the Cells in 2009, uh, the FIP200 complexes mediate mTOR signaling to the autophagy machinery. It's a beautiful paper. Well, thank you, everyone. Dr. Shaker, no, no, don't go, come, come over here. <laughs> Dr. Shaker and I would like to thank you for coming, for filling the audience, you know, not just with your bodies, but, you know, with your attention. And now you can go and fill your bodies with the buffet outside. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>